Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to finish off the lectures on the will to know, which is the first series of lectures from the Collège de France, Foucault's lectures from the Collège de France. And this week we're going to cover weeks 9, 10, 11, 12, plus the lecture on eatable knowledge. So if you're just jumping into this now, be sure to go check out episodes 1, 2, and 3 and go follow my podcast or YouTube channel on YouTube. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it on a podcast platform, pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts, if you prefer that format. Or if you found this as a podcast, you can see me on YouTube where I sometimes release videos. Uh, do all the things that you know I like, like, share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And yeah, let's just jump into the final part here that we'll do on the lectures, uh, the lectures on the will to know, starting with week nine. And I said at the end of last week that we're going to consider more this week the role of money in the formation of this kind of knowledge or opening up or being part of this turn to a new way to organize society that is geared more towards quantification, measurement, uh, established evidential uh, facts as being a precursor to what we know today in terms of the acquisition of information, of data, and verifying information. And he juxtaposed this or he contrasted this with other forms of truth telling, like in the case of uh, the warriors engaging in a kind of daring, a challenge to challenge the other person to tell the truth out of fear of uh, in, in the eyes of the gods to see if they're willing to lie in front of the gods. So here we're going to think more about the place of money. So even as it was being accepted as a form of exchange, that is money, Greeks still relied heavily on barter and religious rights. So even though money circul has circulated for a very long time, or money as a thing that is used as a sign of value, which can then be exchanged for other things of equal value, people still relied heavily on, um, still relied heavily on other forms of exchange like bartering. They also still paid, um, still paid a lot of respect to gods in terms of ritual ritual rights and practices and religious rights instead of just like giving the money like you might see if anyone uh, is catholic you might you might know that uh, you know you give money in these little baskets during mass so mostly money was used to collect taxes when it when it first emerged or used to satisfy religious rituals it didn't necessarily emerge primarily to meet the needs of the market so there were these economic motives taxes, like debts, exchange, and these religious motives, that is the invigoration of a social body through giving redis and, and the redistribution of wealth. Now, as a side point, Foucault uses this to mount a criticism of Marx when Marx writes that money emerged primarily to deal with the exchange of products. So Foucault is instead identifying that money has been used historically for very other means and it emerged for very different reasons, like to collect taxes, like to manage debts, uh, exchanges, in order to propitiate. Propitiate is, um, is a word used to like, in terms of a sacrifice, like for the gods, it's a way to appease the gods. To offer propitiation is to offer something to the gods to um, make them happy. So against Marx, Foucault identifies that money did not just emerge for the sake of exchanging products or exchanging commodities, I should say. Money, however, was quickly used as a tool to gain and maintain power of the wealthy and politicians. And this is just embedded in the very idea that money was first used as a way to, um, to gain um, tax in order to accumulate taxes. And this is also why when money was first conceived, it was heavily controlled. So it would be stamped with like the ruler's insignia or perhaps even the ruler's face. And that was to signify the way that the money was connected to a specific social political body. It wasn't just a free floating thing that mediated the exchange between products in an ostensibly free market. And so in this case, money holds significance in many other ways than just containing value or being the, um, a dead form of value that has been bestowed upon it through labor. 
it can stand in for so much more. Uh, and we, you know, we see this with a few years ago. I remember there were uh, quite a few debates in the United States, I believe, of putting Frederick Douglass's face on money. And if money really didn't mean anything, then there would be no problem for that in the United States. But of course, there was a big problem with that, largely fueled by racism. Or I should qualify that now, you know, there are discussions for to put Frederick Douglass's face on, whereas um, there was so much debate around having Harriet Tubman's face on the $20 bill, which uh, the resistance to it signifies that money stands in for more than just uh, a form of exchange in order to transfer goods. It is very culturally coded to the point that it is so heavily controlled as to what can be represented on it. So that's dealing with the present day. Jumping back to the Greeks that Foucault is interested in, the fact that money can stand in for so many other things, or it can stand in for so many other things, including it can, it can stand in as a religious substitution. It can work as, a, as an economic substitution, a political substitution. Uh, it can substitute power for possible social upheaval. Like if people have accumulated enough money and they're able to challenge others with money. And this is its quality as a simulacrum for Foucault, as that which substitutes, but is not limited to representation. That is, it contains real operations. So in this case, a simulacrum for Foucault is referring to the way in which it has real material effects in its being substitutable. So money can serve, can put on many different hats, and no matter what hat it puts on, that hat is not limited to its appearance. It then has real effects in the world. Now, having said this, he makes a very interesting leap here, and I'm calling it a leap, but I'm not, I'm not criticizing it in that way. He says that money only becomes a sign. That is, it stops to have these real attachments to the world. It only becomes a neutral sign when it has been totally absorbed by the market and as it exists only as a representation of value or of a, like a commodity's value and, and East, in order to facilitate an equal exchange. And the only way this was able to happen was by virtue of the fact that it is a simulacrum. It at one point put on the hat of being only a sign, a representation, not having its own meaning in itself ostensibly. And because it could do that, it at one point became only a sign. It became only that thing that stands in for other things. So in its capacity to quantify measure the formation of money, it helps to limit the excess in order to accumulate, like it helps to limit people accumulating too much money. And for those that are familiar with Aristotle's The Nicomachean Ethics, he says in there like very clearly that it is the sign of an unvirtuous person to accumulate too much money. That is a sign of greed. It is a sign of a detachment from everyday life, and it's a move away from virtue. So the very fact that Aristotle is able to say this, to bring this back to the broader project here in this book or in these series of lectures, was that Aristotle's formulation of virtue as indicative of what he calls the golden mean, so not pushing to excess, like in the case of money, depends upon the possibility of quantifying because there would be no way to actually measure excess or lack unless there was a system put in place that could perform those operations. And this signals for Foucault, although he doesn't outright say it, it's kind of a missed opportunity, that Aristotle's formulation of knowledge hardly complies with some kind of transcendent, um, transcendent neutral objective observation of the world and of people, but it is instead very much culturally and historically determined. It depended upon this transformation of knowledge towards quantification, measurement, linearity. It depended on this in order to establish itself as a form of legitimate knowledge. So money here is related to truth because it is an instrument of social regulation, correction, and rectification. And it can come to normalize itself and naturalize itself very easily in that way once it becomes to be associated with truth. It just stands in for other things. I mean, it, and by virtue of that, it will naturalize all of the relations that exist within it or among it, side by side with it. 
Now, over time, it would lose this potential when it became only a sign for an absent commodity, when it fully embraced this um, position as a sign. And this puts us here into week 10. And here he begins by thinking of the place of law as written and unwritten. So he tells us that an unwritten law is thesmos, and it is more like a rule, but a secret rule that people in power keep secret as a demonstration of their strong memories and ability to properly assess when a situation calls for that rule. So it is a secret knowledge that people hold on to and call out and bring up when they need to demonstrate they are having this secret knowledge, which is a way to demonstrate their power and their place up the social hierarchy. So that's an unwritten law, thesmos. He contrasts this with a written law, which is nomos. And this is more enshrined among the social body. It's more solidified. It's part of the social body. It's written down. People know it. However, written law can be changed through spoken word, and it's appealed to something outside the written words. Or I should say, it can appeal to something outside of the written word. So even though we've written something down in terms of law, that doesn't mean that it can't be changed. Through the spoken word, through argument, through dialectic, through uh, an exchange, people can agree upon new rules that can be written down. So the written word is not reserved for the, wor the world of writing. So here, nomos, the written law, comes to be associated with nature and natural law because it's just taken to be true. It's just taken to be um, properly established because in this world now that we've arrived in, that Foucault has been tracing, there's an appreciation with this kind of recording and this kind of um, establishing rules that can be unchanged that in this case, writing comes to be associated with naturality and with a kind of natural law. However, though, if the spoken word can alter it, uh, like like logos, like um, which, yeah, if the spoken word can alter it, let's leave it at that, then nature can be altered by the spoken word, by logos. So there, uh, So what we have now is that there's the written law, there's the unwritten law, and then there's logos and education. So he suggests that good nomos, that is a properly established written law, only emerges alongside good legislation, that is eunomia, because you couldn't have uh, a written law written out and established unless there was already a pre-established political order that could write down laws that the people would accept as being legitimate. So eunomia, that is good legislation, comes before nomos and is only a particular case, uh, kind of branch of eunomia, that is nomos is. So you need to first have this good legislation to establish the written law. And so in that case, the written law is only a particular case of good legislation. But what, is, what does all of this have to do with money? Good legislation as a system of good, <laughs> or seen as being good, uses money to help things largely as is, or to keep things largely as is. In Foucault's words, eunomia serves to limit economic redistribution where money plays the main role, and money makes it possible to limit the redistribution of power imposed by eunomia. So there's a kind of equilibrium here between good legislation and the circulation of money in early Greek society. So good legislation limits economic dis redistribution so that, you know, poor people aren't going to get too rich. While money, on the other hand, plays the main, uh, money makes it possible to limit the redistribution of power imposed by eunomia, because it is in the interest of good legislators and the people who own the most wealth to maintain their positions. And they do have somewhat equal power at this point. And so what they want is to maintain each other and to help each other maintain their um, superior positions. So the written word is an exercise of good legislation in relation to political and economic power and to maintain these relations so that they are known by all. So the first written words, the first written laws, were set out to maintain a social, uh, social hierarchy, to maintain 
these hierarchical positions so that there would be little room for change and development. And this jives with the insistence on writing, on linearity, on quantification that left little room for disagreement or for negotiation. You know, the price is just set and that's it. Now here we're still dealing with the 6th and century uh, Greece, you know, before current era. So this, you know, we're talking about this, this is 26, 2700 years ago. Now, nomos appears to come from nowhere. It, it has effectively naturalized itself that it is not associated with a specific political body that has created it to maintain that political body's interests. It has instead emerged. It, it, it appears to have emerged almost naturally and is then taken to be, uh, there can be little negotiation for it to change. And when the law has been so naturalized, it can also be difficult to justify and invigorate. So this is the role of the philosopher here for Foucault. Someone will have to emerge who will reveal the law of things so as to give strength and vigor to a law of men which is at the same time in comprehension. Almost as though when Aristotle and when Plato profess their philosophies and their views of the world, especially when those views are attached with judgment about moral character, about people's relationship with truth, about virtue, what they are doing is contributing to the naturalization of these laws that had only recently been established before them, like a few hundred years before them, but that they've come to internalize as being the truth. Uh, but when we actually dig into it, we find that, you know, they're quite incomprehensible, they're difficult to follow, a lot, lots of laws are really uh, inaccessible to regular everyday people. If you've ever tried to read legislation or tried to read laws, uh, it's difficult to get through all the legalese, which is just a funny word for legal talk, legal jargon. And that puts us here into week 11. So here he turns to the question of purity. In Homer's character, or in Homer, characters are expected to bathe when leaving the battlefield and returning home. And this signifies how in that society, there are separate zones. There's, like in that case, like the battlefield and home. And it makes sense. You'd want to shower after a battlefield. And so in their separation between these zones is the possibility of viewing someone from another as dirty, as defiled, and in need of a wash. So if this just stopped with people, uh, you know, leaving the battlefield, because they're probably dirty, go and going home, then fine, whatever. Except it extends much beyond that case. So like before a ritual, for example, but not when the requisite duties have not been completed. So if there's going to be a sacrifice, if there's going to be some other kind of religious ritual, you have to properly present yourself in that space. So it became, it was kind of an effort to, to or a view that people needed to come in neutrally to that space. And they held on their bodies the impurities of everyday life. So it was necessary for them to wash, which served as much a symbolic function as, as a literal one, to wash themselves clean of those impurities, of this defilement. So this wasn't always the case that, like in the case of um, criminality, that a criminal would be viewed as a defiled person and who was in need of cleansing. In the 6th and 7th centuries BC and Greece, this began to occur when rituals and rites became more widely practiced among common people in the working classes because religions started to be occupied in the city where there were lots more people in the city-state. And so there needed to be established a clear line of separation between those who were legitimate and those who were illegitimate. And maybe this is partly due to Hesiod's, you know, Hesiod who wrote work and days, works and days, um, his influence in writing of common people and the way the gods interacted with them without going into too much detail about that. So there were, at the time, there were all these efforts to erect temples and cities, which did the job of bringing the gods to the cities. And they were still, however, under aristocratic rule, but were much more present. So people could have a relationship with the gods. It wasn't just 
oracles. It wasn't just uh, elders. It wasn't just political leaders. It wasn't just the richest people who could have a relationship with the gods. Suddenly, more and more people could. And so religions could be standardized. And those who were, mo who were not pious enough, who did not believe hard enough, who did not pray hard enough, could be ostracized. And so some are seen as pure and some are seen as unpure. So the introduction of the monetary economy, a new type of political power, religious structures in the cities, all of this contributed to the formation of a juridical definition of the individual to establish difference between the pure and the impure. More specifically, the individual emerged in response to new ways the state dealt with inheritance, funeral rights, and murder and other crime. This was a juridical invention of the individual. So we can see that the concern over death and how to manage it birthed this individual. So that I said a lot there, so let me just back up. So Foucault identifies that the idea of the individual emerged in response to the state suddenly dealing with things like inheritance, with funeral rights, and with cases of murder. So all of these center on death. And here's a, just as an aside, never say center around, because if you think about it, how do you center around something? You, you center something, you can't center around it, because that's two different things. Revolve around or center on, but it's not center around. Anyways, we can see that inheritance, funeral rites, and murders all center on death. Center around death. And we can see then that the juridical invention of the individual came about with an effort to try and manage death and things in the world that dealt with death. So it was no longer that only the richest and most powerful could guarantee their ticket to immortality, you know, because they were the most deserving or they had more of an attachment with God or were more rich. Now all people could ostensibly participate and earn their ticket to immortality to be among uh, the gods on Mount Olympus or, whatever, or wherever. And as a, as a side point, Foucault says that this turns the Marxist idea that the afterlife is only sold to people so that they would continue working. It was the opium of the people so that they could be um, subordinated to the capitalist economy. We see here that, you know, the idea of immortality extends much before then, much before capitalist relations of production, not to mention all of the other forms of religion that sold us the idea of immortality or um, believed in immortality long before capitalism emerged. However, I digress. So in the case of murder, we needed to regulate or a regulated justice system replace the spontaneous justice like found in Homer, where people would just immediately get together with all the people around and kind of duel it out as to what the truth was. So here we see that the pure and the impure opposition was fitted over the innocent criminal opposition. And so the murderer, cast as a criminal, becomes a pariah, and they are ostracized. They are excluded from public places and rituals. They are associated with being impure, dirty. And he contrasts this with examples in Homer and I believe even in Hesiod, where there are murderers, and they just say they murdered somebody, and then everyone's like, okay, and they just you know keep living in the city and it's fine because perhaps they supplied some kind of justification for it. Now, this isn't to say that murder is good or that we just need a different social arrangement in order to welcome murder. I'm not saying that at all. The point, though, is to acknowledge that there were these transformations in the way that people were perceived and how criminality was perceived, not necessarily, it wasn't always seen as being uh, a sign of impurity. So these people who were ostracized became associated with non-truth being untrue, being unvirtuous, being um, unenlightened, emphasizing the need to prove whether the crime was committed. So if somebody was going to be ostracized, there had to be good reason for it. And for this good reason to emerge, there needed to be evidence supplied, which goes back to what we were saying before in the previous episodes about this change in the way that justice was conducted, not being a kind of um, oath-telling or truth-telling or a duel or a challenge, but now you have to bring evidence, you have to back up your claims, and all of this. And it had to be done in order to justify this severe punishment of ostracizing people. And that'll put us here into week 12.
So with religion coming into the city, we saw the bridging of a new juridical religious order that demanded a new relationship with the truth. Then, and the need for facts to resolve issues, so as, as I've just said, uh, because people were going to be experiencing new kinds of punishments in the judicial system, it was necessary to have new kinds of evidence to justify those punishments. And this was also a time in which, because the law was associated with naturality and was associated to the heart with the harmony of the social body, anyone who broke the law would be seen as somebody who was attacking the social body so they had to be taken out of the equation, they had to be ostracized, they had to be uh, punished, locked away, or whatever. So they would be a sign of the city's impurity, of the social body's impurity, so they needed to be handled in that way. Now in the archaic period before this, the truth was left to the gods, remember. Now, however, humans must translate an event into a fact that is to properly deal with it, or into uh, many different facts, in order to properly deal with it. And certain specific figures emerge here or are transformed, like the sage as a pure figure who mediates the law and speaks it. Now, as a side point, what Foucault is really giving us here conflicts greatly with what Deleuze gives us in What is Philosophy, uh, for anyone curious, which I'm too scared to cover. One day I'll, I think I'll do it, but it's uh, such a difficult text while also being deceptively easy relative to the other texts. Uh, but anyways, that's just side point. So certain, well, let me, let me elaborate because you're probably curious. In what is philosophy, Deleuze identifies the ways in which, the, the ways that people interacted with one another changed so that there could be friendship among people in the accumulation and the development of knowledge. It wasn't as though people needed to only rely upon oracles or sages or other higher hierarchical hierarchically superior people in order to find the truth they could philosophize among themselves or they could share ideas among themselves and that was the birth of philosophy whereas Foucault is suggesting that philosophy as we know it today in the western sense emerged at a time when there was a transformation of thought from an oral you know from an oral culture to a written one from uh, spontaneous uh, types of communication to more laid out and established forms, the introduction of quantification of measurement, that could set out, uh, that could supply the condition for philosophy as we know it. So here we see these new figures emerge or, or are transformed, like the sage becomes a pure figure who mediates the law and speaks that law. Then there's popular power uh, that has the potential to oppose the law, like um, like the people opposing the law, uh, and to kill the sage. So like some thought, um, some thought believes that popular power killed Socrates. Who Socrates is this kind of sage-like figure, and Socrates wouldn't defy the rules of the city. The rules set him to death, and he had the opportunity to run away because he believed them to be unjust. But he recognized that that was you know he had to submit to that law. And so it was seen as though popular power killed Socrates, killed that sage. Then there's the tyrant, at least in, according to the philosophers, that he was unjustly killed. Then there's the tyrant who exists between the sage, who embodies the law, and popular power that embodies a kind of chaos. For example, there's Oedipus, who establishes a law, but has it fall into chaos. And we'll talk about that more in the next uh, section that deals specifically with Oedipal knowledge, which concludes the this collection of um, of lectures. So Oedipus, who est establishes this law and it falls into chaos. Now, as a kind of side point, Foucault says that this is the problem with Freud. We'll talk about this as well more next time, which we're, we're about to get to, where Freud tried to find a universal truth within Oedipus's actions. But in doing so, he misses the way that the imposition and search for truth undermine this figure of truth, that is Oedipus. And what I mean by that, or, you know, I'll just leave you with that, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. We'll develop it in a minute. And that puts us here into the course summary that is offered, and it's just a lot of review, uh, which isn't totally necessary to get into. And all I really want to say was the extent to which that these lectures reveal the need for us to study the will to know and how knowledge was organized in such a way as to permit 
the belief that there's this kind of natural propensity for knowledge itself, how there was this desire to will and to know. So now we're going to get into the lecture on Oedipal knowledge. So this is about Oedipus the king, and just a brief plot summary, because it's important to know, uh, is that, okay, Oedipus is king, and he has to figure out who killed Laius, because he didn't know it was Laius that he had killed, which is just to put it very simply. So Oedipus is king, and he has to solve a murder. Who killed King Laius? So King Laius is Oedipus's father, and when Oedipus was born, right before he was born, King Laius learns that, at least from an oracle, that his son is going to kill him, uh, and so King Laius freaks out and sends his son off to, I believe he tries to even have him killed, send him down a river or something, and he's picked up by the king and queen in Corinth. And so as Oedipus grows up, he catches wind of the fact that he's going to fulfill this prophecy that he's going to kill his father. And so he's like, crap, I mean, my parents live in Corinth. He believes the parents that adopted him are his real parents. And so he leaves there and goes to Thebes. Thebes. Wow, I never, I didn't know I didn't know how to pronounce that word. Thebes. Thebes. Laugh at me in the comments, please. Uh, thinking that his real parents are in Corinth. But in Thebes, he meets Laos the king, ends up killing him and marrying his wife, which turns out to be his Oedipus's mother. So this is like, he couldn't escape his fate, no matter what. So now Oedipus is king, and he has to figure out who killed Laos, because he didn't know when he actually did this. An oracle tells him, hey, I think it was you. And Oedipus is like, nah, screw that. that I didn't do that. Uh, that wasn't me. But it's his entire murder mystery. He's essentially trying to find out who killed his father, which was him. And that's the slow progression of the story until he finds out that he kills, uh, he, it was he that killed his father and married his mother, and he punishes himself by putting out his eyes. Now, Freud, of course, picked up on this to say that all young boys have this desire to kill their father and marry their mother. They try to, um, they, you know, they want to match their father's power in order to earn the affection of their mother, which a properly socialized boy won't do. What they'll instead do is displace that desire onto other women and be competitive with other men, which I don't think anyone really believes this anymore. Like if you do, then I think you should reflect a little bit, but that was the Oedipus complex according to Freud. Now, the story is not just about that though, Oedipus the king. It is about a man who's trying to find proof of a crime, and he's going through all of these people, these testimonies, people's beliefs, gathering evidence, ultimately implicating himself. So in the, in, in the story, Apollo the god claims to possess knowledge, uh, a blind oracle named uh, Tiresias claims to have knowledge, uh, the chorus of the play has, has knowledge, and this guy all he's trying to do is just acquire this knowledge. So there's a kind of divine knowledge, there's the knowledge of oracles, of gods, but then there's also the knowledge of just reg regular people. So there's, uh, there's the story of Laos who dies, like the truth of that situation. Um, so there's Jocasta knows about this and Oedipus finds out that he too knows about this. There's the story of birth, his, his, the truth of his birth uh, and how he was you know, he was actually adopted as a child, like the truth of that situation. And some, in this case, there's some like messenger, some sheep herder that knows the truth about this situation. And that Oedipus is actually the child of Laos over in the other city in Thebes. 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 So it is Oedipus, Oedipus's, Oedipi, Oedipus's responsibility to gather all the information he can from this person who saw <laughs> what they saw, what the oracle knows, what the gods know, piece all of this together in order to put the story together, in order to find the truth. And Oedipus is himself, not only by virtue of the fact that he's pursuing all of these different people, but he is himself a fragmented person. He has so many different identities. He's uh, outcast. He's a king at some point. He's Corinthian. He's Thebesian. He's a husband, he's a son, he, he serves, he plays all of these different roles, really fragmenting, fragmenting his identity, which makes it all the more difficult to 
just like attribute all of his ills to uh his simply his desire to uh kill his father and marry his mother as freud reads it but oedipus's concern with the truth is overshadowed by his desire to retain power he still wants to be king and if it was found out that he killed the last king that wouldn't look very good so he's smart and he solved the sphinx's riddle of course so he can demonstrate that but he doesn't try to solve the riddle of himself and as he pieces together the information he starts to want the truth less because that would mean that he's implicated. He's the one that killed Laos. So he possesses only a tyrant's brand of knowledge because when the facts don't suit him, then he's going to try to sway, uh, he's going to try to skew them for his benefit. Now, by contrast, there is knowledge of religious figure sovereign who is attuned to the gods if someone just ascribed all of their knowledge and everything they know to what the gods have offered them. So both religious and tyrannical knowledge are conducted in an ordered way, but they differ in, the, in their procedures, how they are actually conducted. So in Oedipus, there is evidence of the oath, like from the Iliad, with the warriors, um, oath, oath taking and oath giving in their procedure for truth telling. And his emphasis on the tyrannical form of knowledge was so great that once he found out the truth, he couldn't live with it. He had to put out his own eyes so that he could no longer see the truth because it, it really it blinded him. He could not possibly deal with it. So he was in the pursuit of truth so long as it benefited him, which if we situate in the broader context of these lectures, signals the fact that truth is, can be very much contextual and can serve various ends. And the way that it is assumed to hold such a superior status in the way that it is procured how we actually arrive at it it signals the extent to which we are bound up within a certain contextual historical moment that puts a pre that appreciates that kind of truth truth telling and those procedures we use to arrive at truth and Foucault takes this opportunity to think about how reductive Foucault Foucault's Freud's reading of this story is by reducing it only to a matter of sexual desire as though there are not all of these other competing desires at play here. The desire for truth, or the will for truth, the desire for power, the will to power, how they mesh, how one's desire for power imposes the rules of what can be considered truth, what can be considered knowledge, and when that doesn't work out for them, how they cannot live with it and have to then put out their own eyes. So the eyes not just being a metaphor for testicles in a kind of castration type situation, the eyes meaning something else. We're seeing and commanding through sight by putting people under your gaze is a way of acquiring power. It is a way of uh, achieving power. Like at the beginning of, uh, if anyone's seen the movie Blade Runner, you'd know that the eye is central to that movie. Right at the beginning, there's this eye. And in the eye is all these, we see the cityscape uh, and all of its industrial, the, the industrial hellscape that it is. And we are, we are asked to wonder, like, what is the role that this eye serves? Is it us? Is it our eye? Is it the eye of another overseer of this world? How can there be an overseer of this world? Is it just a pedestrian? Is this how they see that world? How does seeing act as a kind of power grab, a way to exercise power? So by putting out his own eyes, Oedipus is renouncing to some extent that power or demonstrating that he could not handle it. And yeah, that pretty well encapsulates these lectures. If you made it this far, I congratulate you. Uh, and tell me what you think. I mean, is it all pie in the sky? Do you agree? You can disagree with what Foucault has to say. Uh, I'd love to hear about it. So you can do that in comments. If you're on a podcast platform that lets you leave reviews, you can leave questions there or comments. I'd love to read them. I don't have the time to respond to all of them because I'm only human. Um, but yeah. On that note, stay tuned. Maybe next week I'm going to start on the second series, the second lecture series from the Collège de France. I might do some stuff in between, but we'll see. And yeah, on that note, take care.